Larissa Morantz is a children's book illustrator, educator, and owner of OC Art Studios. She's worked for such clients as Nickelodeon and Simon & Schuster, and has taught art for over 15 years. Larissa's upcoming graphic novel, Blake Laser, will be published by HarperCollins in 2022. Join us today for a conversation with Larissa about her career and her inspiring approach to art and teaching. Welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm your co-host, Mia Rajo, and I'm here today with my co-host, Lauren Brown. And we're very excited to interview our very special guest, Larissa Morantz, amazing illustrator and educator. And we're gonna talk all about her career and the amazing online school that she runs and everything in between. Larissa, thank you so much for meeting us today. <laughs> thank you, Mia. And thank you, Lauren, for having me. It's really nice to be here. And I'm a big fan of both your work. So thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a fan of yours as well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I love what you're doing. <laughs> I just, I try. That's all I do is I try. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all any of us can ever do. But, you know, yeah. but your efforts are actually like, helping people and educating people and enriching their lives. So I think that's a pretty good try in my book, honestly. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's really hard because you're not, um, you know, we're all working from home and we're, you know, working on our own and it's really hard to, um, to remember just, you know, just, it's hard to remember those things, those nice things that you said. So thanks. It's pretty oh, yeah. So take us back to the beginning though. Um, you know, like, did you always know that you wanted to be an artist and um, and how did you get started? Like we, we start every interview like this, just to take us through the journey of, you know, what your beginnings were like and what inspired you when you were younger and what yeah. you got you on this path. Yeah, um, yeah, I love, I love hearing those stories. Um, so yeah, I was uh, a little kid, probably looking at my Sunday funnies and uh, looking at Charlie Brown and Snoopy and Charlie Brown's just got a big circle head. And I thought I could probably draw that. And so I drew Charlie Brown and I drew Snoopy and because they were simple, you know, really simple shapes, simple lines. And, you know, I showed it to my parents. They were like, wow, that's really good. And it's really great to get affirmation from your parents when you draw something as a child and they say, wow, you know, and they react in a way that's really remarkable for you as a child that, that leaves an imprint. And so I, ever since then, I think they, they knew that that was something that I loved because I was always drawing. I think my dad was telling me that um, <laughs> uh, when he was in college, um, he was uh, studying at University of Hawaii and he took me to one of his classes. I was, I was a toddler and um, he was watching me that day and um, I drew a picture of his professor <laughs> while I was sitting in class with him. Aww. And I was, I was probably like four or five years old and my dad said that he came over and looked at it and he said, looks like me. <laughs> um, but I've drawn, I've drawn and I drew in my dad's um, college um, school books and um, I just was always drawing. And my kids really, uh, my, sorry, my parents really um, nurtured that. And I think that was really an important part of um, me coming into that, that space um, as a creative person. You know, uh, they brought me Crayola crayons. I had one of those, um, I don't, I, I don't know if they still have them, these Crayola kits where you could like, uh, they have these templates for drawing rooms, interiors of rooms and things like that. I had a Spirograph, I had like an Etch-a-Sketch, like anything, anything yeah. that was related to like making or drawing I had and they got it for me and I just, I drew all the time. And that's, that's kind of how I knew I was an artist. And then, you know, when you're a kid and you're in school, you, you're doing the thing that you love. You know, if you're into sports, you're playing sports on the field and I hated sports. And if you're, you know, if you like to read, I, I love to read. I was always at the library, but I was always drawing. And um, I actually wrote a um, picture book dummy about this story about uh, me kind of discovering that, that I was not just like, that I liked to do it, 
but that I was actually good at it, you know, because you can like to do something and your parents, your parents could be like, oh, this is great. You know, they love to do this and they can support you. But then that's in the home. You don't understand like where you are necessarily with how your skill is out in the world. And it wasn't until it was in elementary school. Um, it was, it was in middle school. It was my first art class. And, um, the teacher was like showing everybody how to draw like a UFO and, um, just really simple things. And I was drawing them like, okay, yeah, this, this is good. And, and then looking at other kids or other kids looking at mine and them all responding like, oh, wow, you know, like, this is really good. And I'm like, yeah, like, what's wrong with you? Why can't you do it? <laughs> I, there was something wrong with everyone else because they couldn't do it. And it was at that moment when I started to see that no one else really could do what the art teacher was doing as well as I was able to do it. Mm -hmm. Huh, well, I guess that's my thing. But I didn't identify it as my thing. I was just like, oh, okay, you know? So that's kind of when it, it happened, you know? And then, you know, kids are always like, oh, will you draw me this or yeah. will you draw me that? And you go, oh, yeah, I'll draw that. So that's how I, I kind of knew that I was an, an artist. I think that was like the first part of your question. I don't remember the rest of the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it's just basically the journey of like taking you from that part of it um you know like acknowledging that your art or that your art was you know in another level that was beyond and then being able to take that into something that you could you know translate into stories and into illustrations and you know like how did you continue to, to go up um so like you know through high school through college or if you went to college um yeah yeah like um, take us through that part of the journey. Yeah, so um, high school, like art class, my first period was art and I did art all the time because I had a really great, I went to uh, Los Amigos High School in Fountain Valley and the, uh, the teacher there was a huge um, part of my art life. He was just really silly, Mr. Shannon, really silly, really funny. And, um, you know, he would, I don't know if you guys ever did this, he would set up the, the still lifes, like he would put stools or chairs and he would stack them all up on top of each other. And, and he would tell us, draw the space in between. Mm -hmm. What's the space, you know, the negative space. Yeah. So, and, and it was through the drawing of the negative space that we were actually able to accurately, more accurately convey the positive space. And that whole twisting of like looking at the, outside instead of the inside was just a huge switch for me and I remember thinking like oh yeah I see okay draw the negative space so um that that was one of the things that really clicked for me and in in high school I continued with my art and um then I went to college I went to Cal State Fullerton and I studied fine art now the funny thing was that in my senior year I really wanted to be in architecture and I wanted to uh, to like design buildings and stuff because you know you're you're creative, but your parents and you you know everyone is like, well, you need to get a job, and right. you know you need to get a job that's you know that pays and is you know is going to have security. And one of the senior assignments, I I I know I remember the senior assignment really well because it made an impact on me. And um, I we had a family friend who was an architect. And they, they said in the senior project, you know, go find somebody that is doing the job that you want to be doing and interview them. And I went to his um, architecture firm and he showed me around. It was really great. He kept talking about like, oh, when you're into architecture, these are all the things you're going to do. And I was the whole time I was there, I was like, yeah, I'm totally going to do this. And at the very end, when he sang goodbye, he was like, you know, I don't think you should do this. <laughs> so what do you mean? Seriously? And he said, yeah, Larissa, you're too creative for this, this, um, this field. Like it, yeah. as an architect, it takes a long time to build your way up to the point where you can actually be creative in designing the things that you want to design. Like there's a lot of grunt work and there's a lot of, you know, going to the next level. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't crush my dreams. It was just like a, oh, okay, then, so what am I going to do next? And um, when I was looking for schools or what to study, I liked to draw and I liked to paint. So there was a drawing and painting major. So I went, okay, I'll do drawing and painting. Um, but it wasn't until 
my senior year when um, they started talking about animation. And my, my mentor at Cal State Fullerton, Don Lagerberg, was um, teaching all these drawing and painting classes and sequential art and storyboarding. And, and he started, uh, they started talking about animation because he was really focused on, well, we're in Southern California and we're near Los Angeles. And um, what, are, what jobs are available? Well, there's this huge hub in the 90s. There was this, I mean, it still has been this huge hub of, you know, this, this entertainment industry. And um, I went, all right. I want a job. That's what I want, you know. Um, and at the time, I had I had been considering teaching, um, and I met with the counselor, and the counselor was like, "Well, you know, if you want to want to be a teacher, then you have to um, you have to study another, you know, four years. You have to get a master's." And and I'm like, "Well, what does that involve?" And and um, and and all I remember him saying was like writing a thesis. And that scared me because I did not like writing. I was so scared oh, okay. of writing, which is ironic because That's I'm really ironic actually. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm in publishing now, but I was terrified. And I went, oh no, I can't, mm -mm, no, I can't do four years more school. I, I need a job. <laughs> I need to get a job. So I said, yeah, no, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do this other thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on um, this other thing and a lot of my friends were studying animation at the time um they were taking the same classes as me but they they were doing these these figure drawing classes and these other classes that were so much more fun that i thought so much more fun than like the the fine art classes and i went hmm i think i i want to have more fun <laughs> so i i didn't switch my majors but because i was so late in the game but i just started switching my intention mm. and um i i started learning um more about animation and when i graduated with my peers you know a lot of us were they a lot of them were not there wasn't an animation major it was there was a illustration major there was you know the fine art major but this animation thing hadn't really started it, it mm. kind of started when i was there in my last year of school so i i graduated and i thought well i need to get a job and I want to work in animation. So I continued my schooling. I went to um, North Hollywood and I studied at the union. I studied with people like Carl Ganass and Glenn Vilpu and, you know, figure drawing and storyboarding and, and Charles Zimbalis, who, um, who runs the Animation Academy in Burbank. And um, I had a lot of amazing um, classmates who are doing really great things now. They probably all know who they are. Um, but I, just kept studying. So I graduated, but I didn't have enough skills in animation to, to get a job. So I just, I studied for about another year or two and I ended up working, um, I ended up getting my first real animation job as a character designer for the Rugrats. And um, I did that for a number of years and loved it. Um, and then um, I also, got married and um, had babies. And I actually got a job while I was pregnant. Oh. They hired me when I was pregnant, which with my first born, which was really crazy. Yeah. Um, I had taken so long to, to get a job, you know, and that's, that was my main goal was to get a job. <laughs> and, and here I am getting a job and I'm like, I'm going to have a baby, but my, boss and my boss's boss and you know the head of the studio Arlene Klasky female all females and so they were very supportive which was really fantastic so they allowed me they hired me they allowed me to to work from home um, part-time so I worked from home and I drove from Orange County to Hollywood you know for an hour like every other day cool. And, and that's, that's how it was. And then, um, my second born, my second child was born and, um, I realized that I missed out a lot of, um, my son's first things, like his first walk, his first, this, his first that, um, and I had worked so hard, you know, to get in the animation industry, but I was, I, I didn't want to miss out on a lot of those firsts with my daughter. And I, I tell people this all the time. It was really hard for me to leave because, you know, the, the, that job was what I wanted for so long. Yeah. But 
I, I started to figure out that, all right, um, I am just one of many talented artists and I can leave and somebody will replace me like easy. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's only one mom to my child. So mm -hmm. I will go do that. And I went and I did that. And I also, at the time was, um, I was working with Charles and Billis over at the animation Academy and something in me said, you know, it took you so long to get here. Um, it took you so long to acquire the skills to, to get where you are. Um, maybe you could do something about that. Like the last thing that I wanted to do is let all of that stuff just kind of atrophy yeah. to be a mom, but I'm still a creative person and I wanted to continue with my creativity. So I just, something clicked and I went, I should teach. I should teach with Charles. I should teach with Charles at the animation account. That's what I'm going to do. So that was the thing that made it easier for me to say, okay, I'm going to take my skills. I'm going to work. I'm going to work at home. I'm going to be a mom and um, I'm going to teach. So I started teaching this, um, this character design class with, um, with Charles. And I remember not knowing really anything about teaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I want to teach, like, this is what I want to do, but I didn't really know how to do it. I knew only what my mentors did for me. Yeah. So I was trying to mirror their teaching style and their teaching method, but I kind of was like a fire hose with some of my students. Like I gave them way too much information. And, and, and I remember one, one class in particular, this one girl was new and she came in and I sat down with her and I was like, all right, I'm just going to tell her everything I know. And she, she did not come back. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> she was like, no, I think this is too much. And I think I overwhelmed her. And then the next week she didn't come back. And I was like, oh my God, I just, I didn't, I'm not doing this right. Like I need to figure out how to, how to do this. <laughs> so so I knew that I, I knew that I wanted to teach, but I knew that there was a lot for me to learn in terms of like taking the information that is in my head and like transplanting it and putting it like there needs to be this process of how you take what's here, yeah. and, you know, slowly, but surely and carefully and clearly communicate yeah. that to someone else so that they can go, oh yeah, you know. Um, so that, that was a really interesting process for me, but that's, um, when I started, um, I started OC Art Studios actually by, because um, OC Art Studios is my, is my um, online art classes. That started as a, um, as an art class in my garage. Oh, wow. So my wow. son, yeah, my son was five and my girlfriend and her daughter, um, we were talking and she said, you know, we should take, we should sign up our kids for art class. I was like, yeah, because, you know, we're moms, we're sitting at home, we need to figure out what to do to keep our kids busy. So we're always like looking for classes and, you know, parks and things to do. So I had said, yes, let's do it. Like, I totally want to do art classes with our kids. So I said to my husband, like, I need some money for, you know, signing up the kid for art class. And he said, why are you going to have someone else teach your kid? Like, you should teach your kid and you should teach your kid. I said, oh, okay, that, that's a good idea. I said, so, but I don't know where I'm going to do this. Where should I do this? And he said, well, you can do it in the garage. The garage was filled with stuff. And he said, I'll clean it out. So he cleaned out the garage and uh, put some tables and chairs. We kind of organized it. And um, him, my, my son and his friends, we, and I had a, an art class. You know, and I'm teaching five-year-olds. So like, okay, the first time you're teaching to five-year-olds, that's a really great time to teach and to figure out how to teach because you have to make it simple, right? Yeah, it's like, super simple. <laughs> you have to figure it out. So I started reading about, you know, teaching uh, children's art classes and learning about the different methods and the way to communicate and the style of teaching. And so um, as I was doing that, it was like I was nurturing that part of myself and I was also spending time with my kid and, mm. and teaching these classes. And, and um, I started having 
other kids take the class and um, and then other the parents would tell other parents and mm. and then I was running more classes and then sooner or later I had kids that I had no idea who these kids were because I didn't you know I wasn't even friends with the parents and it just kind of started like just going yeah going from there um, and it was great. And then I started adding more classes. I started teaching older kids. And when I started teaching the older kids, like the teenagers, that was really hard because I thought, all right, I still don't want to be a fire hose and give them so much information, but I still need to figure out how to, to do this methodology. Yeah. And um, I had learned about the idea of deconstructing um, concepts. Like, you know, it's basically, it's just the same thing of like where you take a radio or any kind of mechanical instrument and you figure out like, how does this thing work? And you just take it apart and then you put it back together. So I was looking at art in the way that, how would you break it up into smaller pieces? And so I, I really got into like, okay, the elements of art, the principles of design and what are the things that make everything, like what are the ingredients of what makes art art? And yeah. so, you know, and those are things that you study in, in art, you know, when you're learning design, like those are your basic, you know, fundamentals of design and, you know, principles of design and things like that. But I had to figure it out in, so that I could, you know, translate that information as something that was, you know, bite-sized and manageable yeah. for my, my young students. And, and that was really, really helpful. Um, then I had a friend who is, um, who, who saw what I was doing and she said, you know what, you should teach these classes at um, the elementary school. And I was like, oh God, I don't know. I don't know if I should do that. Said, yeah, you should do that. I like doing after school. And, but if you do that, then you have to like, you know, you have to get a license and you have to, you know, do this. And I was like, oh no, that's like, mm. <laughs> I'm just happy teaching in my garage, you know, that's, this is fine. So this started to become a thing where it was like a real thing. And I'm like, mm, I don't know if I should, should do that. Um, but I, th I thought about it a little bit more. And my husband was really supportive and he came up with a great name, OC Art Studios. And um, I thought, all right, well, maybe I can just, you know, try it at our kids elementary school. And um, I, I was teaching at the, I was also teaching at Laguna College at the time. But I, um, I didn't even mention that, but I, uh, as I was teaching there, I, 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 uh, I was, as I was teaching in my, my garage, a friend of mine from the animation studio um, had a friend who needed a substitute at Laguna College of Art and Design. And I was like, oh God, I love that school. Like, I wish I could have gone there to that school. Like that school is amazing. And I sat in um, and I substituted for a figure drawing class. And I loved it. It oh, was, awesome. it was like, oh, it was so amazing. And I walked around school and I talked to everybody and I went into the office and I was like, yeah, this, this place is great. Like my energy was just so intense. <laughs> 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 like, oh, this place is amazing. And oh yeah, if you need, if you need anybody else, you know, if you need another substitute, just let me know. And they, they needed another substitute and the guy that he needed a substitute for, he ended up leaving and I ended up taking his place. So that's how I ended up working at a college without having to get a master's degree. That's amazing. <laughs> you made it there regardless. You're like, you know what? <laughs> Let's skip some steps real quick and just show it with enthusiasm and get this thing done. I mean, it yeah. kind of, it kind of really was it, it, and, and I, I talk to people all the time who are, they want to teach and they're going through the steps to become a teacher, you know, the legitimate way, <laughs> like studying and stuff. Um, I just got in there on the side. I just, you know, I had my professional experience working in the animation studio. I, you know, my, my figure drawings were strong. I had good references. So, um, you know, they had a need, I filled the need and it, and it worked out really well. So. Um, while I was teaching at Laguna College, then I started, you know, opening up my OCR studios. And because I had access to such amazing talent at the college, I was able to hire um, recent graduates um, to teach alongside with me. So I had Laguna College of Art and Design, like graduates teaching with me at the um, elementary schools. And um, 
that's kind of how it, it blossomed. I ended up teaching just in one district. I ended up teaching in like four districts. Uh, I ended up having, I went from like just one school to having like 15 art instructors and, you know, teaching oh. in several different districts and teaching it, you know, we were teaching like hundreds and hundreds of kids at one point okay. and it got so big. Oh. Um, but it was too big. It was too big for little old me. Like I just, I just wanted to teach. And here I was like managing rosters and payments and money and blah, 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 you know, um, just the business side of stuff. Yeah. Just, I didn't go to business school. You know, I was just figuring this stuff out. So I, I kind of cut back a little bit. Um, and I just started to kind of focus on just the, the things that I really wanted to. And, um, and that, and that was going along for a while and COVID, and COVID hit. And I ended up for, I mean, at least for OCR studios, I ended up transitioning um, the after school art classes to online classes. So that's, that's how I got there. What was that transition like uh, to actually like take it out of that physical space and put it in the virtual space? Uh, oh. Like, yeah, how did you adjust to that? Yeah. Well, you know, we're doing this now through Zoom. Um, yeah you know, we were all like, what is Zoom? What is that, you know? And like, literally just before we came on this interview, I'm walking around the house going, where's the best Wi-Fi spot? <laughs> <laughs> Wi-Fi, please, you know? Um, and so our, our the logistics and, and the, of technology is like, you know, it's totally different. But in terms of like transitioning, that was, it was really strange because um, no, none of the schools were doing art. You know, they were just trying, they were all just, you know, trying to not sink at the same time. Like art was the last thing that they wanted to do. Yeah. They were just trying to figure out like how to, to get their kids to pay attention in class. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, I ended up just, um, doing a portfolio um, preparation class. And this is a portfolio preparation class that I had offered um, through Laguna College. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that I do with my, um, my private students, my teenage students that um, I work with a lot of um, high school students that are you know, looking to get into an art, a private art college. So I would help them with their portfolios. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna take this as a class and offer it. And, um, and that happened um, around the summer when we had a lot of social unrest and, you know, people were marching in the streets. And once again, I'm like, why would anybody care about art? This is ridiculous. You know, why am I doing this? Um, but as a woman of color who was trying to promote what I was doing, I had no idea that the thing that I was trying to do with teaching art would be uh, kind of uplifted by others in the community, social yeah. media and other places. And um, it, was, it was kind of an amazing thing because people were then saying, you know, I'm gonna support you, Larissa. And not only am I gonna support you, but I'm gonna support another um, artist. I'm gonna offer a scholarship. Like, what why that's crazy or are, are you sure are you sure that's amazing you know and and it just kind of again it just kind of snowballed and people started coming to me and saying I want to offer a scholarship for a black student to take a class with you okay this is great and 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 then I ended up having enough students enroll in a class that I thought I was going to have to cancel. Like I literally thought I was not going to be able to run my classes. And I ended up not only running that class, but I ended up offering scholars. Um, I ended up offering like 70 full scholarships wow. to black artists. Yeah, it was incredible. And, and that's the thing about this online space that's so amazing because you know, in a classroom, you are limited by the brick walls that you yeah. are confined in. Um, but when you do this internet, you know, you are not, you are con you're not, you, you're confined to the limit of the size of your Zoom account. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I have a hundred, I can do a hundred on my Zoom. So I thought, all right, let's just, 
if I'm going to, if I'm going to run this class and they're going to, you know, if my co costs for this class are covered where I'm getting paid for the time that I'm teaching and the time that I'm preparing the lectures and, and, you know, preparing this course outline and I'm running a class, then it, what difference does it make if I have 25 students or a hundred students? Yeah. So at that point, I'm going to let as many black artists as I can into my space. And that's basically what I've been doing ever since last year is, and, and then recently I opened it up to um, AAPI students. And so um, we just had our first, our head, hands and feet workshop the other day. And um, it's great. It's just, you know, we built this um, space um, on discord, uh, the black lives matter, um, kind of a, a black art matters discord where we're all in there and supporting each other. And we talk about art classes and we talk about art and, you know, art struggles and we share our work and it's just become this really amazing thing that happened that I had no idea was going to happen. That's incredible. I love That's how organic beautiful. that was like that, like hearing the story of how that came to be and just, and the support from everyone in your community is amazing. Um, if you don't mind just explaining to our, our listeners who maybe don't know how your uh, how the school works in terms of how they can donate to support a student and then uh, the classes that are available for everyone else as well, if you can just kind of give us a little recap or description. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so right now it's June 13th and we are gonna be running um, a drawing for animators and illustrators class, which is the, the first class that I was kind of running. Um, and we're going to be uh, running a graphic novels 101 class. And this is a course that actually I, I am, my husband and I taught together with Cartoon Network. Um, so a friend of mine, uh, one of my former students at uh, Laguna College of Art and Design is over at Cartoon Network and invited me over um, to do to part of their enrichment course. So I was, you know, it was pretty amazing to be, to be doing that, but um, so we're doing we're doing a graphic novels 101 and drawing for animators and illustrators illustrators class and it's a 10 week course and so students students pay the fee registered students pay the fee and um, if you're a black artist or an AAPI artist um, you can apply for a scholarship and every registered student funds at least one or up to five um, art scholars so and um, it's on the website, ocrstudios.com. I think you'll put the link on the, the show notes or whatever. But um, yeah, that's that's how. And we're also doing, I, I forgot to mention this, we're also doing kids art classes. So, cause that's what I started was doing kids art. And um, some of my illustrator friends were like, hey, you need to do a kids art class. So I did kids art classes last year. And this this time around, I'm, um, I'm doing a kids art camp um, just a couple weeks this summer. So the information is there on the website too. That's awesome. And let me get this, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're not a registered student, you can still donate as well to sponsor students. Yes. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, um, we've had a lot of really amazing angels that have donated, um, you know, people in the animation industry, people in the illustration industry, um, illustrators, authors, agents, um, showrunners, um, voice actors, um, storyboard artists, visual development artists. There are so many people that are working in the industry who are seeing what I'm doing and are helping me to support this community of artists so that we can bring more talented, div uh, a, a more talented diverse pool of artists mm -hmm. um, to these industries because there's, you know, there's just not enough. And we don't want to have this like, oh, there's not enough talent be this reason for the lack of diversity in these in these industries. Cause that's just not, it's not true. Yeah. And and by by elevating everyone else, it helps to, you know, lift all boats and uh, everyone rises in the end. So that's been my goal. Um, trying in, in with OCR studios and in, you know, acting as a mentor to the students in, in the OCR discord, OCR studios discord in the community. I'm just trying to, to give back the knowledge of what I gained and um, so that I can help others to, to, you know, 
make their dreams come true. Even though it's really hard to work in the animation industry and it's hard to get into publishing, like, yes, they are challenging. You know, it's 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 very challenging to get into those industries. So a lot of our uh, donors, they give back. We're gonna have a um, we're gonna have an interview with Stephen Neary, who's a showrunner for Fungies over at Cartoon Network, and. Um, uh, we have uh, a couple of other people who are lined up um, working in the industry who are going to be giving interviews. Shara Tuayosa, who is a, an amazing illustrator. She runs Punky Aloha in Hawaii. She came on and uh, did some work with us and shared her knowledge about, you know, illustrating and things like that. So we've had a lot of really great people give back. And, um, and I think they're really excited about sharing what it is that they know in their experience with with everyone. So it's been really, it's been really organic and it's been really fun and it's been very rewarding. That's amazing. I, I just love hearing about how, you know, everybody came together to make this thing even bigger and better than it already was. Um, and I'm also curious, I know that a lot of the growth has been organic, but do you have any plans of how you want to, like what you want to see the school become? Or do you want to continue to let it grow the way it has been? Which I think both are valid. <laughs> Right now, honestly, I'm just kind of going day by day and like yeah. students know this, like I just, just trying to, just trying to get through like the next day. Um, and didn't even mention, like, first of all, I want to mention like the amazing people that I have working with me, Eden Barber, Caleb Cleveland, Danny Vondere. These guys are amazing, um, talented people who I have working alongside me, teaching, co-teaching the classes and assisting. Um, I could not do it without them. I just literally could not because it is so much, it is so much, it's a team effort, you know, because yeah. we're we're working with these students and then we're giving feedback and, you um, so yeah, it takes a lot of work. Um, but in terms of like moving forward, you know, you guys know you have your own projects. You're also working, you know, professionally. So I am working on my own projects, and that's something I haven't even talked about yeah. is the publishing part. Sure. Um, <laughs> so we could talk about that. Okay. But right now, I am I'm working on a graphic novel um, that my husband wrote, and I'm illustrating and. Um, kind of takes a lot of time so yeah, <laughs> oh <my> God, yeah. <laughs> and you know lauren you got a project you were just telling me about um <laughs> and we were talking about how we need to like use our journals or our you know to organize and pro plan our projects and things like that so yeah i'm just i i kind of go with the flow if you haven't been able to tell um <laughs> I, I like to, I kind of like to plan, but I'm not a huge planner because I also know that in my life, um, things just happen. And if I set intentions, um, things happen faster. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for me, my, my planning is more about like discerning what it is that I want to do and then putting my intentions and my energies into those things. Mm -hmm. And that's that first funnel, you know, that's that first funnel of like, how do you narrow down all of your ideas and all the things that you want to do? And how do you discern what you're putting your physical energies into? And so once I figured that out, um, things start to happen, you know, and I do a lot of meditation. I do yoga. Um, I do a lot of journaling and I, I totally believe that when I put those things out there that like the universe is like, Oh yeah. Okay. Here it comes. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For you real quick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it's really, it's really simple things. Like I would sit down in the morning and write in my journal, my intentions for the day. And I need like, this would happen years ago. I would write like, okay, I need to, uh, I need to, I need to book this many schools and I need to con connect with like at least two schools and I need to today, I need to book two schools. And then that morning, two schools would call and say, hey, we would like your program at our school. And it's literally like, I did nothing. I literally just sat here and went, mm -hmm, I need to write it down and I need to manifest it and it happened. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
So your magic is basically what you're telling me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I, I maybe, um, I am known in, in, in my close circle of friends to, to be kind of, to kind of have that ability, but, and it's kind of weird saying this on the YouTube on putting it out there. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very clear about what it is that I want and very clear about what I don't want. And, and I focus my energies on those. And I also, I think very positively about these things. Like I expect that these happen. Yeah. I expect that these things are going to happen. And it's kind of silly, but the worrying, um, it makes things go the opposite way. Like when mm -hmm. I, when I think about like, and I just think it's going to be easy and it's going to happen, um, then it's easy and it happens. Um, but the more I doubt the things are going to happen, that, that they're not going to happen, then, then that happens Then there's doubt and things don't happen. So I needed to hear that. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> Yes. So you guys need to take your, you know, intentions and your ideas of the things that you want to do and put your energies into those things. And like, and, and your energies is your ideas, your thoughts, your, you know, the, the time that you are spending in your day-to-day -day life, like on those things so that those things can happen. Because the more time we spend worrying about the you know, if you plan for the worst case scenario, worst case scenario is going to happen. You're going to get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not that you're not looking at those things and you're not planning for those things. You're just mindful, but you're not giving those things as much attention. Yeah. So you don't get as, Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have you seen that happen in your own life? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like giving them attention gives them power, you know? It does. And I like your simplicity, your, your approach is so simple in the sense it's like, I know what I want and I know what I don't want. That's, that's the kind of clarity you need. Mm -hmm. You can just go forward. I love that. It's a different way to frame it rather than like, I have all these things I have to worry about. It's like, that's, it's a whole different way of approaching issues that you have in your life or just like the things that you want to have in your life. That here's what, here's what I want. Here's what I don't want. Put that stuff over there. Here's the stuff that I want. Let me focus on that, direct my energy to it and it will happen because your energy is going to the right place. And I think that's so easy to forget to have that mindset because all we can often see, especially as artists, is the things that we're worrying about or the things that are holding us back or usually it's ourselves that hold us back. And yeah, I know, right? <laughs> just like, yeah. And just allowing, and allowing that drive to stop us from doing the things that we need to do. Yeah. And and that's what prevents so many of us from finishing our projects and from carrying out, a, you know, something that we're trying to work on or learning a new skill. It's just all this worry about what can't we do instead of thinking, what can we do? What do we have the power to do? And how can we get to that next step to do this and do this and do this bigger and better? And that's a much better way to frame it. Yeah. And there, something that you said, like cued into me, a, a, a quote that I just heard, I do, I read a lot of like, <laughs> self-help books and stuff and you know things that help you achieve your goals and things and so I, I can't remember who said this so forgive me whoever said this but um measure the gains not the gaps yeah. and so and this was something that I was just telling my um my stepmom the other day that she was so focused on um she teaches violin lessons and she's also learning um she's also taking classes to um become licensed and certified so that she can um be like do the next level and she was always focusing on the things that she wasn't getting like there's so I mean there's so much you don't know you know out in the world there's so much you don't know and if you're just sitting as an art student or anyone who's trying to master anything and you're just sitting there going oh my god there's so much stuff that I don't know and you're focusing like on all of those things it's so overwhelming mm -hmm. but so what I what I gathered from this quote and what I said to her was like you know you taking these classes for a while you learn a lot and we all learn a lot as we're going through the process and and I tell my students this all the time like don't focus on that you don't know how to draw all of these things focus on what you've learned just this last month 
Like, what can you do now that you couldn't do last week or last month or last year? And I, we see a lot in like social media, like this is my drawing from 2016 and this is my drawing from 2020. And you see the difference. And I think when people, the, the great thing about that particular like social media meme or whatever it's called is, is that it's helping people to applaud themselves at the gains that they've had, you know? And we're always going to have gains if you're always putting that forward momentum in. And I think that's the, the thing to remember is to always put that forward momentum in and always be drawing. Like I'm always telling my students, you should always be drawing, you should always be creating. Um, and that's how, you, uh, that's how you get to the next level, not by focusing on what you don't know, but focusing on where you've been and just taking baby steps and just, oh God, enjoy the process, you know? Please forget to enjoy the process, you know, because that can be overwhelming too. Yeah, trying to rush progress isn't good for anybody. <laughs> no, it's not, you know. I mean, do you guys, do you find that when you're drawing that you maybe forget to enjoy the process? Sometimes, yeah. When I'm, when I'm trying to work through a project, um, when I have so many other ideas in my head, I often forget that like this is just another manifestation of my art and I can enjoy this and make this something that is special to me as well even if it's not my idea um I have a hard time with that and I'm still trying to reframe my mind so that I can more effectively do the things that um you know that make me happy and and I yeah it's sometimes it's really difficult to step back as an artist and look at the things that you've done and the things that you've accomplished and be like wow like that's you know, that's me. Like I did that. I was able to bring my work from so far, you know, away from this goal. And now I've gotten here to be able to do this professionally and to be able to make money from it or to be able to make my own story from it or to manifest it in a way that finally I can see this vision through. And that's the thing that we don't remember to do often enough. Yeah, for sure. Mia, do you ever feel like that too? Oh my gosh, what you just said about gaps versus gains. I mean, I needed to hear that because I feel like when I'm painting in particular, that's where I see most of my gaps. I mean, drawing is still fun and I know there's gaps to my knowledge there, but I can lose myself in it more. But for whatever reason, sometimes I can't enjoy painting because I'm so focused on all the things I don't know. So, and it pulls me out of enjoying the process. And it's just, the point isn't to be perfect right now. It's to hopefully learn, you know, in the future or like over time but it could still be enjoyable while you're not perfect or while you're not, you don't have all the gaps filled as you're saying. And so that's just such a great reminder, I think. And I like that it's easy to remember too. So it's like, I'm gonna actually stick that on a sticky note on my computer. Yes. So it. <laughs> just put it on Twitter. I need this on a shirt. Yes, and, yes. Uh, <laughs> my bot will like make it into a shirt and sell it to you for like $25. Yeah. <laughs> Measure the gains and not the gaps. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Such a good quote to keep in mind. Yeah. Fantastic. Because mm -hmm. I want to know how Oops. you how you got into publishing. And and you have so many skills, by the way. Like I just sure. I, I really admire how flexible you are in terms of your art skills. Like and, and just if you could talk about a little bit of all of that if you Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So okay, so publishing. Um the way I got into publishing was I was working in animation. I was working uh, on the Rugrats and um, I was approached um, uh, by Simon and Schuster um, working at, on the Rugrats. They were looking for artists who worked on the show to create um, some of their ready to read series and their picture books for, um, for Nickelodeon, the intellectual property of the Rugrats. And um, my boss at the time was working on um, the picture books for Rugrats. And it was funny because she, um, Sharon Ross, she's, she's an amazing artist. Um, she would work during the day. And then in the evening, she'd work on like the picture books. I'm like, how is she like, how is she doing like two things at one? Like, can you do two things? Because it took me so long to get, you know, the job. Yeah. The job of character designer at Rugrats. And so then I was like, okay, this now I kind of got complacent and I was like, well, this is my job. But then artists, we would sit together at lunch or we would talk and, and then we would talk about like our own work, you know? And I'm like, my own work? 
What are you talking about? I don't, I don't have any of my own work anymore. I literally draw the Rugrats all day long and I would draw outside of work and it was, it was the Rugrats. It's like, what happened to my style? Do I even have a style? Is my style the Rugrats style? Because and working in animation, especially as a character designer, you have, you have to take a test and you have to make sure that your style matches seamlessly with everyone else. And as a character designer, you're creating that style for the board artist, the animation artist. So you have to really be keyed in and drilled in on that style. And, and so I was like, mm, what is my style? But um, I ended up working, doing picture books, um, and that was part of my transition from leaving the studio to working at home. Um, I left the studio and I started, I started teaching um, at the Animation Academy with Charles Zimbalis. And I was working on picture books for Simon and & Schuster. And I was doing that while I was, you know, taking kids to play dates, um, playgrounds, Chuck E. Cheese, and make, you know, taking phone calls from New York, you know, by the bounce ball pit in Chuck E. Cheese, talking to my art director and you know answering questions as to like what's wrong with the art on page twenty eight. I'm like I can't, <laughs> I can't answer you that right now. Maybe I can let you know later when I'm at home and I'm not surrounded by little children screaming. Um, so <laughs> that was my life. Was um, and in in terms of like the the like the manifesting things too, I, I would. I would um, I would finish a book, and because I did I did like almost a dozen picture books for Simon and Schuster. Um, I did some from Random House. I did Rugrats, Rugrats All Grown Up. Um, I actually worked on the Rugrats All Grown Up show on the animated series. Um, I did um, the Wild Thornberries. I did uh, a little movie tie-in for the Rugrats Wild Thornberries movie. I worked on Avatar, The Last Airbender. I was a licensed uh, licensed uh, illustrator for SpongeBob. Um, you know, a lot of like Nickelodeon property. So because I was able to figure out, okay, this is how you do the style. You just, and I also worked in portraiture before. That was one of the things that I did as a college student. I would. Um, I would take my easel down to like the beach and I would draw switch quick sketch people. So I, I was really good at getting the likeness of people. So understanding how to get a likeness for a, a person is very similar to understanding how to match a style. You know, yeah. it's also the similar thing to like deconstructing, you know, art and figuring out what makes art look like it is. And so deconstructing art also helped me to make sure that my art was on was on model, you know, for these different, um, these different intellectual properties that I was working on. So I ended up working, I did like nearly a dozen books for um, Nickelodeon, but um, I always wanted to do my own stuff. And um, so how that happened is I was teaching um, an art class with my, my daughter was in the class. Um, she was only like nine at the time. And I was teaching like how to draw cute animal creatures. And it was a big hit with my daughter who was nine and she drew all these amazing little cute animal characters and, and she was drawing them everywhere. And my, my husband was like, these are adorable. Like we should do something with these. So I was like, maybe we should make them into shirts or something. And he ended up, um, we ended up turning it into a picture book. So he wrote uh, a poem um, and that was our first picture book. We, pub we self-published it. It's called Dream Alicious, and the characters were the Fuzz Buds. And uh, he came, he's great with coming up with names. So he came up with the name Dream Alicious, and he came up with Fuzz Buds. And um, so we we self-published that. And then um, we he we had another idea for another story about this little hippo. Um, and the way that came about was, I guess my daughter, our youngest daughter um, was asking for a dog. And my husband was like, we don't need a dog. We have a hippo hiding in the backyard. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Where, what do you mean we have a hippo? And he said, it's, it's hiding. That's why you can't see it. So my husband lied to our children and, um, and then he said, you know, a hippo that wants to hide but isn't good at it would be a really funny book. So I ended up drawing a 
hippo character that kind of would fit in with our fuzzbuds character and that's how Clyde the hippo was born mm -hmm. and so we wrote our, our self-published book was Clyde likes to hide and that book is basically this 500 pound adorable little hippo that wants to hide but is terrible at it um, <laughs> and so um because my husband's so good with titles he came up with other titles too like um Clyde likes to slide and, and so that was like the next one. And I ended up making a dummy for that. And I, and I thought, okay, this one, let's do this, but let's try and get this published. And so what I needed to do to get my picture book published was I needed to get it to a publisher. But how do you do that? You can't do that unless you have an agent. So I needed a literary agent. And I went on this whole path of like trying to get a literary agent for years. And here I was an artist who worked in animation who had already illustrated like almost a dozen books already. So I thought piece of cake, right? No, it was not a piece of cake. It was not easy. And that's the thing that I would um, like tell myself in, in retrospect is Okay, I, I studied animation and I understood, you know, narrative storytelling and I understood backgrounds and perspective and, you know, all those things that an illustrator would know, but I, I didn't really understand how to take my own style or to develop my own style. And I didn't understand how that would translate into making picture book. Part of the process was narrowing down my style and figuring out what that was and in writing my own stories um, and taking my husband's stories and, and illustrating those. And um, I kept telling myself, I need to get an agent. Like it was a thing, like you go to the store and you pick up milk. And I think part of my, my mindset was wrong in that it was something that I needed to acquire. And it wasn't, it was some, it's a relationship that I needed to build. Mm -hmm. And once I changed my mindset from, I need to get an agent to, I need to find an agent who will work with me, who loves my work and who will support me and what I'm doing. Um, that's when that's when it started to happen. So that's when I started making connections with, with um, different literary agents and, and end up connecting with my current agent, Rachel Orr at Prospect. And she took me on and she took my husband on as a team. And so we, he would write and I would illustrate. And so he wrote um, her Clyde the Hippo books. And we have four book series. And it starts with Clyde goes to school and then it's Clyde likes to slide and Clyde lied and Clyde likes to ride. So you can see all of them rhyme except for the school one, but that was our kind of um, introduction to that. And I, and I actually came up with the idea for Clyde lied and um, my husband wrote it. So okay. that, yeah, that, that's that story. And then, um, so that, that was a really interesting thing because it, it was something that we knew we wanted to do for a long time. And, and then when it finally happened, you know, it's really amazing. You know, you don't just get one book, you get four, and then you have, um, you get so excited waiting for, you know, your book launch. And our book launch was scheduled for, um, last year in April when everything shut down. <laughs> oh, no. oh, my oh. So, you know, we waited so long and, you know, whatever, but, you know, we aren't the only one. There were yeah. tons, everybody had everything canceled. So, you know, it's, that's just, that's just how it was. Um, but around the time that I was finishing up the last book, um, I had been, kind of thinking about um, doing a graphic novel. I was reading a ton of graphic novels just because I love them so much. They're such an amazing, um, it's such an amazing um, way to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, this is like, I know boarding, I know, you know, all this, that's something that's really, and, and I'm a fast drawer, drawer um, you know, so I figured, you know, I, I could probably do that. And then, um, I got a 
connection, um, I got a, a, a DM from Kwame Alexander, who, oh. yeah, um, and he, he sent me this message, was like, your art is ebullient, and leave it to Kwame Alexander to come up, you know, to use yeah. a delicious word like that. <laughs> and have you ever considered doing a graphic novel? It's like, oh, yeah, I have, like, this is crazy. But um, so I was talking to him about doing a graphic novel, but I was also illustrating my husband's picture books and we were working together on those things. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm, if I'm illustrating a book for Kwame Alexander and it wasn't necessarily set in stone, like this was just him like approaching me and asking about the possibility. So, but in my mind, I'm like, yes, it's gonna happen. Um, but I had to consider like, as an illustrator, where am I gonna, you know, put my efforts in? And so my husband had a, a story that we had kind of written um, like a year ago, um, a, a picture book. And our agent was like, mm, you know, this kind of, there were problems with it. So we, we shelved it. So we, I thought, you know, maybe we could take that picture book story and we can kind of revamp it and make that into a longer, you know, form thing. And, and, and maybe that could be a, a graphic novel and maybe that could be our graphic novel. So then like, I realized that I could do a graphic novel. And now because this person had called me out and asked me if I was willing to do it and, and called my work a bullion, I mean, what do I say about affirmations of your parents telling you like you are a good artist, you know, it was, it was really silly that it took this strange person to say something so nice and amazing about my work that gave me the confidence that I could do it, you know, but it's just that outside someone seeing your work and saying like this, you have an amazing gift, you have the potential and just being and just being open with that. And that was enough to make me think, okay, yeah, I can do it, but let's do it together. So my husband and I worked on this project, Blake Laser. he and I wrote the, the story together and it's about a biracial family um, because I'm from a biracial family and I have a biracial family. Uh, I'm a young girl who is a galactic genius, but is unaware of her uh, potential and her and her family have to save the world from impending doom because aliens are sucking the uh, energy from the sun and if they don't do anything about it within 48 hours the earth will turn into an ice ball oh wow so that's our story oh, <laughs> when is it out um uh, well it's scheduled for 2022 excellent that's on harper collins so yeah, congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited to see a graphic novel from you. Yeah. yeah I'm me really too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I can relate to. <laughs> That's a move right there. Yeah, I can't wait to see it either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it's a lot of work. It's yeah. a lot of work. And yeah. how do you how do you balance all of that? Like just make you making a graphic novel right now with uh with also teaching and you know like running running the school um like what is like what does that look like for you it's crazy <laughs> it's really crazy um i don't know how i'm doing it it's just happening um <laughs> spinning plates you figure out which plates are the most important ones and you don't drop them yeah. um, you know and it really is about setting your priorities in which things get the energy. And once you are able to discern what those things are and really limit it, it's, it's better. I'm not a pro at this. I'm actually probably pretty bad at it, maybe better than some, but I mean, I'm here I am measuring the gaps and yeah. not gains. So I see areas for improvement, um, but I feel like, you know, yes. I, am I better at managing things as, than I was a decade ago? Heck yeah. Um, I'm doing a lot, um, but a lot of these things are super important to me, you know? 
like running the school and um, making sure that I'm opening up these courses to, you know, students and and getting them a free education. That's that's tremendously important to me. Um, and working on my books is, you know, tremendously important to me. And you know, family is in, you know, really important too. And so you have to make sure that you're you're putting your your efforts into the things that are the most important. And that's all it is. I mean, it's not all, but one, here's the other thing I will tell you is I get super distracted and part of managing or at least promoting the online school is I have to be on social media. And I hate, yeah. I hate it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I watched that that documentary. I don't know if you guys saw the documentary Social Dilemma. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, so we're all the product and we are all like we're just, you know, we go on Instagram and we post our stuff and we're trying to get likes, but really Instagram needs us yeah. to post that stuff so that people can go onto their platform and that's how all of these platforms are and if you think about it that way it's really icky. Yeah. And I hate it. But how do I get people to see what I'm doing? How do I get people to sign up for my classes? I have to be on these, these platforms and it's so annoying. Um, but I, I, I recently, um, about a year ago, I discovered this app called the Freedom app. And it's something that I pay for and I use it on my, on my internet and it blocks me from doing things that I shouldn't be doing. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there are other apps that are like it. Um, but when I discovered it, it was kind of a game changer for me because I, I have intentions, but I'm very, you know, willpower is not that good. So I will make sure that I do my promotional stuff in the morning or in the afternoons. And then I set my time of, okay, I cannot be on these sites like I can't go to Pinterest I can't go to Twitter oh, Facebook yes. or you know Reddit any of those black hole you know, yeah <laughs> any of those things like I can't go on it on during certain times and that that's really helpful too that's great it's a great way to balance that so like actively like stop you from falling into those like distraction pits because it can be a lot like everybody is there throwing that content so you just endlessly scroll and endlessly just let yourself fall into it and also you see what everybody else is doing you're like wow they're so productive how do i be this productive it's like step get one is to not be on here <laughs> get off <laughs> step stop. one is to maybe get off social media stop <laughs> scrolling make your own content <laughs> make your own content yeah in fact that's the thing it's like if I feel like I'm doing this on my phone, like too much, oh, mm, that, yeah. movement, that, my, that movement in my mind is my key. Like, okay, I'm, I need to get off. And, and the more content I look at, I don't, I know you guys have talked about like social media and like as an artist and, you know, and how that affects you. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at other people, you're always comparing mm -hmm. and, oh, it's so awful. So that's another reason why I will get off too is, to make stuff, you know, you gotta make this stuff. It's Making really stuff cool. is how you get out of your head, at least for yeah. me. <laughs> so, yeah, you, know, you gotta be the content creator. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> gonna be an artist. <laughs> be an artist, yeah. <laughs> There's so many amazing things to see out there, but it's it can be really debilitating. It can be really overwhelming especially when you're looking at something oh i wish i could draw hands like that or oh look at the way they do hair or, oh look at the way they blend the color mm -hmm. like you're looking at all of the amazing things that are out there but you could also be making your own amazing things yeah to put out there so that's what we need to remind ourselves of that's a really good app to have i'm gonna look that up because <laughs> yeah i can definitely be susceptible to this crap and it would be nice to be able to get a better working method because obviously you know it's like not, nothing's working yet <laughs> not nothing some things are working right some things are working that's true because i'm still creating so yes the gains not the gaps thank you <laughs> the gains not the gaps lauren mm -hmm. you're, doing, you're doing a great job <laughs> it's like the learnings are happening in real time everybody this is what this is what we get from these episodes exactly i love it <laughs> That's why I love doing this so much. <laughs> it's 
it's been fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. This time, is there anything else that you would like to talk about, or would you like to give our listeners any advice for us for signing us off? Yes. Um, okay. So I was thinking about this earlier, and um, there is this concept or this word. It's called icky guy, and it's a really funny word. It, it sounds it sounds like ooh, is that guy icky? No, it's it's Japanese, and it's spelled I K I G A I. Have you heard of it, Lauren? I haven't, but yeah. Okay, so the idea behind Ikigai is um, that it is your life's purpose, it is what it is that you were meant to do. And it's like basically a Venn diagram of these four things. So um, the four things are, um, and I can't remember, I wrote it down, um, what you love to do, what pays you well, what your strengths are, what you're good at, and what the world needs. Mm. Right. This I've seen before. Yes. And if you can figure out, at least in terms of an artist, like what your strengths are, what the world needs, what you, you know, what you can get paid for and, and what you love, then that is your niche. And that is the thing that you can put all of your energy in. And it's not necessarily an easy thing to figure out. You know, you might be in the process of developing your strengths. You might be in the process of discovering what it is that you love. Um, those things take time, but as you're, as an artist and you're developing your skills and you're learning to figure out what those things are that you, you love, um, then figuring out, you know, if the world needs that, you know, and finding your niches is, is a really hard thing to do, you know, as an artist, but Part of it is really just getting cued into what it is that you're, you love and what it is that you're good at. Um, I'm going to mention my um, friend and former student, Shara Toyosa, again, for um, Punky Aloha. She also has a graphic novel coming, or no, she has a picture book coming out um, soon. But um, I spoke with her, and, and I'm bringing her up because she, in, when she was a student of mine, she had a totally different art style than she does now and it was something that she loved to do but it wasn't like maybe what the niche her niche wasn't you know out there it wasn't what the world needed but you know she embraced herself because she's you know a Polynesian artist she lives in Hawaii and so she embraced her culture and when she embraced her culture and she began to illustrate these brown beautiful women with long hair and big flowers in their hair on surfboards and you know with these big beautiful bodies in these beautiful environments that is something that she is very familiar with because that's that's her thing that's her culture that's that's when it hit a nerve and that's and she's skyrocketing now you know and i think if you can you know tap into something that is it's not only what the world needs, but it, it's like speaking your voice. It's speaking your truth, you know? Um, and it's something that you deeply care about. That's part of what the world needs because the world needs in this, we, the world needs that from artists and content creators. Like don't just try and paint, you know, something just to make money. Yeah. You want to paint something that is, you know, tapped into your heart. And that's the whole thing about being joyful about the process. You know, it's like, Lauren, you have these amazing, these cards that you got to work on. And, and Mia, you have these projects you're working on and you're, we're focused on like the, you know, oh, like there's too many and I'm, you know, I'm, I have so many things to do, or I'm not able to like, can I really make the skill? But the more we focus on the joy of the process of doing it, the more that love comes in and it goes back out into what we're doing. And really the stuff that I've done, and I'm sure this is the same thing for you ladies too, the stuff that you do that has the most heart in it, that's the stuff that resonates with people because yeah. it shines through. Mm -hmm. And if you can put your love and your emotions and your gut and your soul, <laughs> you know, your intentions and your voice and everything about who you are, into something like that's the stuff that resonates and that's the stuff that sells that's true people are like take my money <laughs> <laughs> give me that i love that how did you do that it's amazing so yeah that that icky guy is is my my last word of advice awesome 
that's probably that Venn diagram is probably the thing that I'm going to put on the sticky at my computer and just like make sure that I'm continuing to aim for that. <laughs> it's a great compass to have. That's a great compass to have. Yeah, I think so. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Uh, lastly, is there anything that you would like to promote before we go? I yeah. know that you talked a lot about what you've made, but let's just do it official right yes. now. Yes, thank you. Um, please sponsor a student at OCR Studios. Please register for a class, uh, either teens or adults, um, for a drawing for animators and illustrators class or graphic novels classes. Um, I will be selling uh, the video recordings to that because I think that is probably what I could have said before what the future will be. I need to be working. So I would like to sell the content on the website and I will do that soon. Also, Clyde the Hippo picture book series on Penguin Workshop. If you could um, look into that and purchase all four for your neighbor, your niece or nephew, for your library, for your local elementary school. Yes, that would be great. That's wonderful. Larissa, thank you so much for joining us. This has been wonderful and really, really inspiring to see all the things that you're doing and all the things that you are amazing at. And we've taken away a lot of good advice and I hope everybody here did as well. But um, we really appreciate you giving us your time and, and talking to us today. Thank you. The pleasure's been all mine. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, help everybody will join us next time um, in two weeks. Uh, but I really hope that y'all enjoyed this talk and we'll see you later. Bye everybody.